you may find you can't get the leverage to get the torque on that rear lower bolt. So you want to resort to the foot and a little strength from the leg. There we go. When you get old like me, it's a lot easier that way than trying to use your shoulder. In closing, here's just a couple of tips when you're putting the front wheel back on. Make sure you take the jack out from under the front suspension. You won't be able to get the wheel on. Just move the jack back to your jack point as a safety backup and then be sure and use the wheel alignment pin. You'll see now, for an old guy like me that's got to lift this tire into position, how much easier this is. I always put the alignment pin up on the top and I get the top hole kind of lined up and I can see through the hole like that and then I can fit that in place and immediately get one of these lug bolts started and get this one snug down. Now I'll go ahead and put the rest of these lug bolts in. I'm just going to snug all these down. I can remove the alignment pin, get this final lug bolt in. You want to make sure that they're all snug and bottomed out before you lower the car down because that's when you want to torque the bolts. Go ahead and lower it down and torque these lug bolts to 78 to 80 foot-pounds and now you're ready to do the other side. This past week's been really busy here in the shop and I've come up with about three or four kits but two of them are directly related to lubrication and two of them solve some real problems I was having here in my own shop, including this door right here. Well, this is the kit I came up with. This is the door hinge lube kit. And the heart of this kit is this special grease gun made in Germany, which you can use to lubricate the door hinges on these older models. Now, they carry these, uh, lube, they carry these hinges up through the 126 series all the way up through 90, all the way up to 90, poor. Okay, let's try that again. Now you, you can kind of see what happens around here when you get kind of late in the day and you're starting to lose a little bit of the mojo. <laughs> but no, the hinges I'm talking about are those hinges with the special fittings that would allow you to use this style of grease gun to shoot grease down into the hinge they were in all the old models in the 60s and 70s. They carried it up to the end of the 123 chassis and also up to the end of the 126 chassis, but beginning with the W201 and the W124, no more hinge lubrication fittings. That doesn't mean you can't squeak some very thin lubricant down in those type of hinges as well, but I tell you, oops, I dropped my... Uh, <laughs> Synthetic grease. Now I include synthetic grease in this kit because you do need to lube the latch and the centering pin assembly and the door striker. That's very important. As well as lubing the hinge on a regular basis. That's probably every six months. You should be lubing, you should be lubricating these, I should say. And along with that, oh, by the way, no, I'll wait on that one. But I came up with my deluxe lube kit with carrying case and of course this you already know if you've seen my other videos this evolved out of a lot of frustration here in the shop not having ready access to all the different types of lubricant I use and so already this is a great addition to our shop and as soon as I put this up we're really selling this kit it seems like a lot of people out there are thinking the same way I am. Hey, how many times have you spent running all over the garage or driving down to the local hardware store to pick up some lube, special lubrication that you need for your old bins? So those are just two of the kits that I've been working on this week. In a minute here, I'm going to show you something else I've been working on, which I'm really excited about. But first, and this is in deference to all you who have complained that I talk too much. So what I'm going to do for the next few minutes is just not talk. I think a, a video is worth 10,000 words, okay? So you can enjoy this silent video.
I'm also really excited about something else we've been working on this past week. In fact, we finalized it today. A new tool. What else? I mean, maybe this should be my most favorite tool of the week. But over the last week, I've been working on a complete kit for the DIY mechanic to be able to go in and successfully adjust the injection pump timing on their old diesel. This includes using the drip method and getting a reliable reading on the one drip per second procedure. Many have had real frustrating issues trying to use the factory recommended drip tube method, but I think I figured it out. And along the way, I began to realize that anyone doing this job is going to have a really hard time if they don't have the right tool to get to a couple of the nuts that hold the injection pump to the engine, particularly the bottom nut on that triangular flange on the IP, on the pump itself, and also at the rear, there's a bolt that holds a bracket that you have to get to. Now, any of you that have tried to adjust the IP timing on a turbo diesel, OM617, you're gonna say, yes, Ken, I know what it's like trying to get to that rear bolt. I know a couple of mechanics, by the way, that they would just remove that rear bracket because it was so frustrating to get to that rear bolt and try to loosen it and then retightening it after adjusting the pump. Well, I don't recommend removing that bracket, but I knew if I was gonna make a successful kit that would help people do this job, I had to come up with a wrench. Look at the evolution of the wrench today. Now this is the wrench that's currently available on the market, and I found that this wrench is okay, but it's lacking, particularly with the W115 240D and the W115 300D, which are the most difficult pumps to adjust because you have such a minimal clearance between the pump and the frame in down in there. So we went to work, started out cutting, bending, twisting. Wait until you see what we come up with. But I am really excited about this wrench because not only does it give you multiple options to get to loosen and tighten that bottom nut underneath the injection pump, but it also will allow you to get to that bolt in the back on that bracket and help you to loosen and retighten that once you've adjusted the pump. Let me show you the evolution of the new tool this past week. Let me begin by showing you the tool that's currently available on the market. In fact, we sell this tool and have sold this tool for quite a few years. It's designed with a curve, 13 millimeter box. Notice it's a very tight box because you have minimal clearance on that bottom nut and it's pretty much a right angle. So it allows you to go underneath the pump and get on that nut and work it. The only problem is look at the angle of the handle coming off here, particularly on this W115 because of the location of the frame and other hoses in the area, you have a very difficult time getting enough travel. Okay, that's the key. It's not just getting this on the nut, it's how much travel are you gonna have to tighten and loosen it, okay? So we decided let's do a better wrench, okay? I'm not trying to knock this wrench, but most of our tools have come about because we feel there's gotta be a better way. So we'll set this one over here. So we went to work and we tried to make a couple kind of similar to this tool with the 90 degree bend. We decided, well, let's make one shorter. So that will give us a little more travel. The problem with that is you don't have any torque. And of course, we decided to go with a long 13 millimeter combination. And we ran into the same problem. Even though we tried to change the angle a little bit, we even tried to bend it back a little bit this way. And uh, you know, okay, that didn't work. So then we said, well, let's get some crazy bends to it and see if we can go about going underneath and getting some leverage and travel. And that didn't work either. And then we said, well, let's get creative here and get a couple different angles on it like this, put a bend here. Maybe we can get a pipe on it so that once we put the pipe on it and then we can break it loose, see, a little bit tighter there on the bend radius. You can see it's a little bit tighter there 
and we got the pipe and then of course we ran into the same problem. Once you extend the handle up into this area, you're going to hit something. So then we thought, oh, well, let's get crazy here. <laughs> and this was the first attempt. And we thought, okay, we come up here. We needed to offset this. We found out right away we had to offset that box so that it will allow you to get on it easier because a straight box, it's difficult to get on that nut. See that? So we came up with the offset and then we started playing around with these angles. And we played with this one and thought, okay, uh, that may or may not work, but we were having some clearance problems. And then let's see, let's try a couple different bends. And here it is, folks. Here's the final wrench. I bet none of you have seen a wrench like this anywhere in the world. And you wouldn't believe how many times we played around with a W123 240D, a W123 300D Turbo, a W114 240D to make sure that this wrench would give you all kinds of combinations, even including using the open end wrench on the inboard nut on the IP pump and then having just the right angle to go underneath the back of the pump and get to that dreaded bolt on that rear bracket on the turbo diesel engines. So we're pretty proud of that wrench. I bet all of you out there say, well, you're right, Kent. I've never seen a wrench like that. So we're still working on this injection pump timing kit. It's going to include a new procedure for setting your injection pump timing. It's going to include all the little goodies you're going to need, including the drip tube and some other specialty items we've created here and the special wrench, of course, because I don't recommend anybody take on this job without this wrench here. You might save up to an hour to two hours of time just by having this wrench. So I don't want anybody to complain about the price. This is not easy to make, by the way. My favorite tool this week is my new metal cutting chop saw. This thing is amazing. Believe it or not, using what looks like a standard wood cutting blade, although it's highly modified, I can cut through mild steel, aluminum, and even rubber hose. This is reinforced rubber hose. So take a look as I show you some examples on how this saw works and how it compares to the older abrasive chop saw. Just try cutting this type of hose with any other saw and you'll realize how excited I am about this new tool. I want to show you my favorite product of the week, and that's what I call the engine diaper kit. Yes, these are diapers for leaky engines. Now you may say, well, Kent, why would you ever use that? Well, there's a lot of these old cars that have little seepages of oil. It's not real bad, particularly the typical head gasket oil leaks on these M103 or M104 engines that may just seep out and barely leak, but it's enough to get your underbelly pan all wet and oily. And what you can do is every oil change, screw one or two of these high absorbent pads. Now we're talking, these are super high absorbent. So this just isn't any pad you buy anywhere. It's very high absorbent. It's used in the industry for oil spills. You screw these onto the bottom of your underbelly pan in the cars that have these type of covers underneath. And this is going to pick up all the little drips. And so when you go to change your oil in 3,000 miles or three months or whatever, you can drop this, pull these off and throw them away and add a couple more. So I just love these diaper kits. I just, you know, I'm not going to need to use it on this 560 SEC because the one little oil leak I found in this car 
I've been able to fix. So this isn't going to be a problem. But on some of the other cars, you may decide, well, trying to fix every single little dripping oil leak in the car may not be cost effective, if you know what I mean. So if you can't find these locally, by the way, we do carry these on my website. We sell them in just packs of four, so you don't have to go out and buy a huge bundle. You can purchase these in larger bundles from industrial supply stores that handle you know, products related to hazardous waste or oil spills or so on. But this is a good one. Remember this. If you have an older Mercedes that you think you can use these to stop or prevent, you know, excessive dripping on the driveway. I even took an old Mercedes diesel. This was a 123 chassis once, and I made an aluminum underbelly pan so that I could use these diapers on the old diesels and that's really cool but it was a lot of work i thought about you know coming up with a kit to sell this conglomeration of brackets and aluminum that i came up with but it was just too expensive to manufacture but for those of you who are creative out there if you have one of the old 123 or 126 diesels or even older like this 240 dw115 chassis here you might want to fabricate a thin piece of aluminum and a couple of aluminum brackets underneath and then you can use these diapers to catch those oil drips as well. You know, if you've watched my videos in the past, you know I drive in and out of a place that has a bunch of buildings, and sometimes I even refer to having to go back to the farm to go to work. But indeed, this is where I work. It is a converted dairy farm on 40 acres. I've been renting this facility from the owner for over 15 years now, but I thought I would get my quadcopter out with my camera and take you on a little flight, a little aerial view of the farm, and you're going to get to see the lovely setting in which I get to work every day. It's really kind of neat. Now, of course, in the rainy, windy, cold winters that we have up here, it may not be so fun, but right now you're looking at my airstrip. That's the airstrip that I land my RC models on, and I also have enough room here to fly all my RC helicopters. So it's a lot of fun. I can get up quite high altitude with this quadcopter and you can see with the wide angle lens, you get this really panoramic view. And I'm sure you're looking down there trying to recognize some of those cars. Well, a lot of those buildings that you see, I have some of my other cars stored in. So it makes it a very practical place to work you know <laughs> in fact in the summertime i can stop working on my cars and come out here to my little flying field that you see here and just fire up my rc model and have a great time so so much for the view of the farm we're going to land this quadcopter now and uh, go back into the farm and get back to work of course i have an excellent crew around here that does all the work hi everybody uh, you know Working Nothing hard. would happen if I didn't have this excellent crew getting all these products out on a, a daily basis. Woohoo! All right. Walking through Paul Allen's Heritage Aviation Collection with Ron was quite a trip. We met some very interesting individuals and we also found out some very interesting facts. So this is the exact airplane I saw in the jungles of New Guinea 42 years ago. I landed on the island of Babel and I got out of my Cessna and I walked up and down the runway and I couldn't believe it. I was looking at three or four shot up Japanese Zeros and a Betty Bomber and lo and behold I come to this museum and start reading about this particular Japanese Zero and I find out that this is the plane I saw, the exact plane I saw in the jungles back in 1973. Unbelievable. This is the plane my father flew during World War II. He was an instructor in C-46s like you see here and also spent many hours training bomber crews in C-47s. This is the Folkwolf 190 that was crash landed in Russia in a swamp and because it was so cold it survived all those years. They cut down a bunch of trees and brought it out of the swamp and have restored it. What a beauty. Can you imagine what it would be like flying one of these and particularly you pilots 
you know how squirrely this thing would be on landing or takeoff with that wide gear and tail dragger stance they had to have high clearance because of the size of the prop because it's got a big smokestack that takes oh. all the heat from the glass out. You can see it from the LeMay parking lot. Right yeah, and it's just right there. He's got his camera out. You could get a little souvenir for somebody yeah, special. That's right. okay. <laughs> so, Ron, what do you think of this collection? It's uh, fantastic. The only downside is someone's walking around with the camera. <laughs> what a beautiful collection. And I also say goodbye to Ron as he heads back to England. He's gonna hang around Seattle for a while and check out some of these other museums. But uh, it was fun meeting Ron, and I wish him all the best in his restoration of my old 52 220. You know, if you've watched my videos in the past, you know I drive in and out of a place that has a bunch of buildings and sometimes I even refer to having to go back to the farm to go to work. But indeed, this is where I work. It is a converted dairy farm on 40 acres. I've been renting this facility from the owner for over 15 years now. But I thought I would get my quadcopter out with my camera and take you on a little flight, a little aerial view of the farm. And you're going to get to see the lovely setting in which I get to work every day. It's really kind of neat.